Well, brethren, let's once again look to the Lord for his help and blessing upon our time together in this hour. Holy Father, we come to you as the one who has described himself as the God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. You have told us in your word that every good and every A blessed gift comes down from above from you, the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow cast by turning. We thank you for the good things of the food we have enjoyed together, the open-faced fellowship around the table where we felt free to bear our hearts and minds to one another to learn from one another, to enter into each other's concerns. We thank you that we have experienced something of that inter-church communion that we are wrestling with in our time in the Word together. And we come to you now praying that the Holy Spirit will once again be present, upholding each man to listen attentively and with a critical ear to have the Berean spirit that you will help your servant that he may speak as he ought to speak. Enable us by your grace and power we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we return, brethren, in this hour and after a supper in our tummies that is crying for blood to work down there and steal it from up here. So let me urge you to gird up the loins of your mind and give concentration to our study. We return to consider together our duties as pastors in seeking to cultivate interchurch communion through our pastoral labors. After an introduction, we then address two things in the previous hour. First of all, I drew your attention to two foundational presuppositions that are critical in thinking through this vast subject. And then secondly, I address some four important qualifications in conjunction with the matter of cultivating interchurch communion. And now we take up number three in handling the subject, some major biblical data underscoring our duty to cultivate interchurch communion. Whenever I speak on duty, I try to be very careful because you're messing with people's consciences. A conscience enlightened properly by the scriptures concerning its duty now understands further what it is he must do to be well-pleasing to God in his walk, in his labors, and in his ministry. And I want us to consider some of the major biblical data that underscores what I am persuaded is part of our God-given duty to cultivate interchurch communion. We'll consider, first of all, some of the key texts found in the book of Acts. And whenever we're considering data from the book of Acts, we must always remember the distinction between that which some have chosen to call things that are programmatic and those that are paradigmatic. And I have found that distinction to be tremendously helpful in my own reading of the book of Acts, reading it, wanting to know what God did in the history of redemption and what God has laid down as patterns for our lives at this point in the unfolding of God's redemptive purposes. That which is programmatic refers to the once for all activities of God in redemptive history. They are part of the divine program moving toward the eschaton, moving toward the consummation of all things. When we come to Acts chapter 2, the initial Pentecost, Acts chapter 8, the Samaritan Pentecost. Acts chapter 10, the Pentecost in Cornelius' home. And then Acts 19, the Ephesian Pentecost. There we are having before us 
a record of God's dealings that are not paradigmatic as the Pentecostals and the Charismatics handle those passages, saying, this is what God did, therefore this is what God desires to do in the present day. You and I must seek a distinct spiritual experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their terminology, in what I regard as a twisted understanding of the biblical terminology, baptism over in the Holy Spirit. But that which is paradigmatic is a record of what God has given us as a pattern for the life and ministry of the church throughout the ages. The paradigmatic are the norms which we should seek to attain by the grace and blessing of God. So that going to the book of Acts for some of the data relative to the nurture of interchurch communion we're going to find both programmatic and paradigmatic data, and we must be careful in sorting out the two. Then there's a second major block of texts that are found in the epistles of the New Testament. Time will not permit me to even attempt to read many of those that I've listed in your notes, but I will list them or have listed them for your future reference and I will read just a sampling from that list underscoring these experiences of the cultivation of interchurch communion and asserting that they are paradigmatic for the church in all ages. After the apostle has been dealing with the subject of uh, what we call Christian liberty in Acts chapter, uh, Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 15, verses 25 to 28. This is what the apostle writes. But now I say, I go unto Jerusalem, ministering unto the saints, for it has been the good pleasure of Macedonia and Achaia, two large regions of primarily Gentile churches, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints that are at Jerusalem. Yes, and it has been their good pleasure. In other words, they didn't do this by constraint. It was their spiritual delight, and it grew out of a spiritual perspective. And he goes on to say, it's been their good pleasure and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, they owe it to them also to minister unto them in carnal things. And in this incident of that collection among these primarily Gentile churches for the poor saints of Jerusalem, there are many paradigmatic principles and examples of interchurch communion. A second passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Are we beginning again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as do others, epistles of commendation to you or from you? For you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. And here in this verse, the apostle lays out this very clear assumption that the people at Corinth would understand what he meant when he said, epistles of commendation. That when someone was going from one area to another, he would ask his spiritual leaders for a letter commending him as a true saint so that there was a recognition of the validity of the existence and discipline of a distant church that should not just take this man upon his own testimony. I'm a brother, open your hearts, open your homes, open your tables and receive me. The ordinary pattern was you should have a letter of commendation. Paul says, now we don't need that because you yourselves are the commendation of our apostolic validity or the validity of my apostolic calling. And then, of course, the entirety of chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians, and you see the tremendous pains to which the apostle went 
that everything pertaining to that collection for the saints at Jerusalem would be honorable in the sight of God and of man. And when I preached through those chapters a few years ago, I was just floored with the veritable gold mine it contains of principles that are indeed paradigmatic for many dimensions of interchurch relationships far beyond the mere matter of taking up a collection. And they are there for you to dig out and to apply in your own specific situation. And then you have a passage like 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4. So we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you endure. Paul says, wherever I go among the churches, I glory in the things that God has done among you. I glory in you in the churches of God. And just as he could say there was the brother, Timothy, whose praise was among the churches there in the Lystra area, the apostle was constantly in his letter writing expressing his passion to see this awareness of what God was doing in one church, in one group of people, wanting others to enter in and to embrace whatever responsibilities would grow out of their oneness in the Lord Jesus. And then that oft-forgotten little epistle, 3 John, verses 5 through 7. These epistles have some wonderful materials concerning the subject of interchurch communion. Verse 5 of 3 John, And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote to you a new commandment, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we should walk after his commandment. This is the commandment, even as you heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it for. Now he's informing them of something that is going on. Many deceivers have gone forth into the world, even those that confess that Jesus Christ, confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Here he's giving this church an inoculation from his knowledge of what was going on in other places. They're floating around out there among the churches. Beware lest they seek to come and infect you with the poison of their anti-Christian doctrine. Now I say these are just a sampling of the larger sampling I've given you in your notes that indicate both a reflexive desire and a conscious attempt to cultivate a consciousness of the oneness of the body of Christ and to express that oneness in ways appropriate to the various circumstances of the churches. Surely the following insight of Owen is justified by the biblical witness. And this is some strong language from Owen. Churches are appointed and established in order, as has been declared, ought to hold communion among themselves or with each other as unto all the ends of their institution and order, for these are the same in all. Yea, the general end of them is in order of nature considered antecedently to their institution in particular. In other words, before a particular church comes to birth with its God-given responsibilities, there is a doctrine of the church universal and the responsibility of the churches among themselves. And when you become a particular church, you are taken up into this antecedent will of God with respect to the communion of the churches. The promotion hereof is committed jointly and severally unto all particular churches. Wherefore, with respect hereunto, they are obliged unto mutual commission among them, uh, communion among themselves, which is their consent, endeavor, and conjunction in and for the promotion of the edification of the Catholic Church and therein of their own, as they are parts and member of it. 
so that genuine promotion of internal spiritual life should be joined to this passion for real, conscious, edifying involvement in the life and ministry of the church universal. Now let me say by way of application, there's a kind of narrow provincialism in ecclesiastical matters which knows and cares only for a very restricted circle of the church universal. And I would state, based on the scriptures and that helpful summary of Owen, that this is to be delinquent in our biblical duty. Again, Owen says, No church, therefore, is so independent as that it can always and in all cases observe the duties it owes to the Lord Christ and the church Catholic by all those powers which it is able to act in itself distinctly without conjunction with others. And the church that confines its duty unto the acts of its own assembly cuts itself off from the external communion of the church Catholic, nor will it be safe for any man to commit the conduct of his soul unto such a church. He says, if you've got a church totally provincialized, with its nose stuck in its own navel and its eyes not looking beyond the flesh surrounding that navel, he said, don't join such a church. You value the well-being of your soul. You will become provincial and narrow-hearted and with a constricted vision of the glory of Christ's work among the churches. Having then identified some of the major biblical data underscoring the duty to cultivate interchurch communion, we come now in the fourth place to consider some practical perspectives and guidelines with respect to the performance of this duty. We're moving from the theology of the fact that there is such a thing as the universal church, the church Catholic, to some of the problems we'll have if we seek to take seriously the obligation to nurture communion with that church. Now we're going to consider some practical perspectives and guidelines with respect to the performance of this duty. First of all, we'll consider some of the ways in which we can nurture and express our oneness with the body of Christ and begin or continue to foster real and productive interchurch communion. And I want to give you nine practical suggestions. Number one, by our, and by our I mean as pastors and elders and leaders, by our acquisition, assimilation, and communication of information. There is absolutely, brethren, no excuse for us and our people to be ignorant of the major factors concerning the state of Christ's church in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, and outside the circle of our more well-defined theological and ecclesiastical convictions and practices. It means that on your part, you will discipline yourself to read, Read some periodicals that become a window to the church in other places. Read some of the magazines available to track with the suffering church. Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, Operation World to give you a broader scope of understanding. Where is Christ's church planted around the world and what is the Lord doing in the ongoing fulfillment of his promise? I will build my church. Should we not be interested to know how his workmanship is going forward in the building of that church? I mean that you must cultivate the disciplines necessary to engage in correspondence with other brethren and in the judicious use of your telephone and your computer. It's impossible, impossible to read the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament epistles without coming to this conclusion that whatever means of active communication were available in the first century, the leaders and members of the churches made it a matter of conscience 
concerning this acquisition, assimilation, and communication of information among themselves. This is why Paul did not think it would strike the ears of the saints at Ephesus in a strange way when he writes to them in Ephesians 6, after laying out the armor of God that we are to put on, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and on my behalf, that utterance may be given unto me in opening my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Or Colossians 1, 3 to 8, another example of how this disposition just oozes out of the New Testament epistles. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, what precipitated his prayers? Having heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have toward all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in the heavens whereof you heard before in the word of the gospel which is come unto you even as it is also in all the world bearing fruit and increasing as it does in you since the day you heard and know the grace of God in truth. Word Paul, get this information. Well, he tells us, even as you learned of Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So here was the assimilation and then the communication of information that fostered communion among churches at some distance from one another and the churches and some of its leaders. It's impossible, I say, to read the book of Acts and the New Testament and not to see this operative. At the conclusion of the main issues to be covered in this lecture, I will address the subject of interchurch communication primarily by letters and seek to give some practical guidelines for the composition of the kinds of letters that will foster interchurch communion in a helpful way. Letters that don't send a man to his desk to waste an hour trying to sort out what should I include, what should I not include, how come prayer request here, prayer request here. You give him half a day's work to try to organize what you've spilled out in two to three pages in a stream of consciousness. That doesn't work, brethren. It's when the things are laid out clearly and simply, it's then that people are likely to say, oh, this is stuff I can assimilate and I can readily and easily convey to my people in the fostering of inner church communion. I think it's pages 7 to 10 in your notes. If we don't get to go over that, uh, it's there. Uh, that's basically a lecture, a separate lecture I brought some years ago at a pastor's conference but it says everything I feel needs to be said in general along with some specific counsel about the communicating by letters to foster interchurch communication. So I've said I'm going to give you nine headings. I better get on my horse and kick it and move. Number two, by the communication of concern and goodwill among the churches through the leaders of those churches. In those words, the churches salute you or greet you, and such words as, all the brethren greet you, these are concrete expressions of the awareness of leadership seeking to convey goodwill and the consciousness of common faith in communion between the churches. Paul was speaking on behalf of the churches where he was laboring, when he'd write to Colossae or write to the Philippians, and when he would say, so-and-so, brethren, the brothers and sisters, greet you. He's letting the people of the target of his letter know, you are known and loved and thought of and prayed for. All of that is wrapped up in those simple words. He didn't need to write a three-page email, but terse condensed in such a way that the principle is conveyed in all of that. And that's what we're getting at. So suggestion number one, 
our personal acquisition, assimilation, communication of information. Number two, by the communication of concern and goodwill among the churches through the leaders of that church. I've got to look at one other text with you that is a classic in this area. That's Philippians 4, verses 21 and 22. Salute or greet warmly every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers that are with me greet you. Further, he says, all the saints, all the saints around me, all that I know of, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. God's had some of his elect in the most unlikely place, and I want you to rejoice with us. So he just says, especially, they were part of the generic saints, but he says, especially that jewel of God's grace taken from the muck of Caesar's household, they greet you as well. And in that very Philippian letter, you see the exchange of personnel between Philippi sending their gift, Paul sending Epaphroditus back. He says, I know you're anxious for me, and I'm sending Epaphroditus. He's going to tell you everything, so just be patient. When he comes and he brings greetings, he'll give you all the details. He's fostering there. Communion, yes, between Paul, particularly in the church, but there's the principle of information deliberately, consciously conveyed as a matter of principle. It doesn't just plain happen. So this is going to demand personal discipline on your part of letter writing, telephone calls, reminding your people of their privilege to engage in this exercise when opportunities afford them. And brethren, this is the place, one of the simple things you can do. Establish bulletin boards and post your letters on those that come from the churches. And that's why it's critical. It's it's not likely that people are going to stand there and read a three-page letter and sort out a prayer request here, an answer to prayer here, a great need here. You do the work of organization, someone who has 10 minutes between Sunday school and church, can stand. These are the things God has done. And in his heart, lifted up in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for doing that there in Verona, for doing that over there in Exeter. Thank you, Lord, for this. Lord, help me to remember these. Take a moment to jot down the request. Make them part of their own time alone with God. I urge you, make good use of up dated bulletin boards. Don't have stale old letters that have been up there getting yellow while waiting to change them into something fresh. Thirdly, by the communion or sharing of goods and material necessities. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, as I already alluded to, are a veritable goldmine of principles relative to this aspect of tangibly expressing the oneness of the body of Christ. There's only one reason All of these churches in Achaia, Macedonia, were gathering this money, even begging Paul. They were poor themselves, and Paul says, they begged us. We didn't even go to them. We figured those folks are so poor, we ought to take up an offering for them. But when they heard we're taking up an offering for the saints in Jerusalem, they grabbed my coattails and said, Paul, Paul, please, let us have a part in this. Why? They're my brothers. They're my sisters. We're bound together in the church universal. The members in Jerusalem are hurting. We're hurting with them. And our open hands and open pocketbooks are a tangible expression that we are one in Christ. You have Proverbs then, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and then another wonderful passage. God used it greatly in the early life here of Trinity Church is Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 27 to 29. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. Solomon writes, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when, adverb of time, when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when you have it, by you. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. If it's in your hand to do it, do it. In the early days when we were a bunch of nomads, 
for 13 years. When we broke with the denomination in 1967, we began the first few weeks to meet in the Ladies' Club of Caldwell. Then we met in the Jefferson Street Elementary multi-purpose gym auditorium. For 13 years, we were nomads. One of my preacher friends says, Al, you're the only church that when I want to come and pay a visit, I got to check up and ask where in the world you're meeting now. But they were precious days for many, many reasons, not the least of which was this. There were other newly forming churches that did have land and had committed to a building program. And an appeal went out. If you can help, help. We gave away tens of thousands of dollars when we didn't have a dime in a building fund. We didn't have any of that. And when people said, isn't that foolish? We said, no, that's biblical. We had good in our hands. It was in our power to do it. We might not always have it. And our conviction was, if we will obey this text, the time comes when we're on the need and God will not be debtor to us. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and running over, it shall be given into your bosom. And when God led us into these massive building programs, it was absolutely amazing. There aren't too many left around that remember those days when one of the men generated into his computer how many people were members, what the average giving was, what the prospects were that we could buy, uh, build a building. We had been able to get hold of this hunk of land. And every day that passed, he said, the gap between what we've got and what we would appear to be able to have and what it cost gets bigger and bigger. We said, fooey on the gaps. We've got some promises to plead with God. And God enabled us to build that first building there, and within less than two years, or no debtedness, I can't remember, then we built this larger complex. Within two years, whatever indebtedness went into was liquidated, and the whole history of the life and ministry of the church has been a wonderful fulfillment of God's promise that he will meet the needs of those whose hearts are open and generous to meet the needs of others. And you just keep yourself aware of those needs and respond as you can. I'm not advocating being foolish. I'm not advocating being irresponsible. I'm advocating obeying what the Bible says. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Now, if I have a stock of cash and is responsibly marked out for this or that gospel enterprise, it's not in my power to give it away. So that doesn't apply. But apart from things in that category that are pure kingdom commitments that I cannot break without violating the law of God at some point, when God puts it in my hand, he says, give to him to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do it. And then a wonderful thing happens. What happens when someone gives you a garment? Someone might give you a car. Every time you wear that sweater, every time you drive that car, the consciousness of where it comes from binds you all the more deeply to the one whose hand was open to you. And what happens when churches share in this way? It deepens the bond of their true koinonia and their true sense of oneness in Christ. Number four, practical suggestion to cultivate interchurch communion by cooperation with other churches in scriptural causes. When like-minded churches in a given area can work together more efficiently in pursuing common goals, they ought to do so. And we're back again to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. The principle stands on the very face of those two chapters. Here were these churches spread through the Roman Empire. Here are the churches in Jerusalem, in Judea area, in great need because of poverty. And what do they do? The Apostle Paul engineers a whole team of men to be able to collect and honorably to deliver that wonderful gift to the saints at Jerusalem. Here were churches delightfully cooperating with one another, not jealous. Well, if we send uh, uh, this man from this church and not from that church, they're going to upset. It was none of that. The whole 
the whole mood of those two chapters is that everything from several churches choosing brethren from their midst to go to Paul urging that Titus go along with them and then the unknown brother whose praise in the gospel was throughout the churches. All of that is a wonderful display of this inter-church cooperation which cannot help but speak to the world that these people are bound together by bonds we know nothing about. Fifthly, by the sharing of ministerial gifts. Ephesians 4.11 would seem, and here I will not be dogmatic except with regard to apostles, Ephesians 4.11 would seem to indicate that the gifts of Christ are given to the church collectively. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the church. Again, I think it's hard to limit that to the church local exclusively, but to the church universal. They are Christ's gifts. He equips them. He empowers them. He gives them to his church. And although recognition and stated function is primarily in the case of the local church, with the ordinary or permanent gifts, surely this does not mean that the local church must be the exclusive sphere of that gift's influence and usefulness. Some gifts are given to the church, universal apostles and New Testament prophets, I believe it's referring to, and evangelists, I have big question mark, there simply, in my judgment, is not enough exegetical material in the New Testament to take the three uses of the word evangelist and build a theology of an evangelist. You try to build a structure on three words, it's going to be very shaky, very shaky, in my judgment. So, recognizing that, the unique factor of the involvement of the apostles, you have in the book of Acts a passage that I believe is not programmatic but paradigmatic. Let's look at it for a moment where we have this matter of the sharing of ministerial gifts. Acts chapter 11 verses 22 to 26. Acts chapter 11. You'll remember that the church in Jerusalem is scattered after the uh, persecution raised by Paul upon the death of Stephen and men are dispersing and they are preaching and they go as far as Antioch. Verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus, Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they were come to Antioch, spoke to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and great numbers that believed turned to the Lord. Here are these unnamed evangelists, gospel preachers, whatever we might call them, and the report concerning their activity and what had happened comes to the ears of the church that was in Jerusalem. Now, question, how did it get from Antioch down to Jerusalem? Somebody squealed with some holy squealing. Did they send someone? It could well be that they said, look, God's done something here. But the church in Jerusalem is the mother church. That's where the Spirit first came and where the apostles were still residing. We've got to get news. What's going on down here? So by some means, unrevealed in Scripture, news comes to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they send forth Barnabas as far as Antioch, who when he was come and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. So the work continues. Barnabas validates this is indeed a work of God. There's no evident deficiency. He begins to teach and preach to them, but apparently, again, having to read between the lines, he comes to the conviction that the level of either my gift and my understanding or a combination of both is such, I've taken these people as far as I can take them. We need someone with greater gift, greater knowledge to take them to further levels of spiritual maturity. So what does he do? He takes the initiative. And the scripture says that he sent forth 
to Tarsus, and he went forth to Tarsus to seek for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. This is an amazing thing. Here's a man who's not an apostle. He's a proven brother, son of consolation in Jerusalem, and it's like he takes charge with almost apostolic authority and says, hey Saul, you're coming here. We've got some people that need you down here. And apparently the Apostle Paul, having spread the desire of uh, this man of God before the Lord, is persuaded that's where he ought to go. And he went forth to seek for Saul. When he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that even for a whole year they were gathered together with the church and taught much people, and that the disciples were called Christians, Christianos, little Christ, first in Antioch. They came to such maturity, and Christ was so central to their life and to their demeanor and their bearing, they got called little Christs. Would to God people had to call our churches a collection of little Christs who love one another as he loved us. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So I see here uh, a very real helpful example and certainly a passage like Romans 15.1. This matter of sharing the deposit of gifts in any given church for the benefit and well-being of other churches. In Romans, did I say 15.1? I meant 16.1. I commend unto you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church that is at Sancria, that you receive her in the Lord worthily of the saints, and assist her in whatsoever matter she may have need of you. Well, one thing she didn't need them for was to be a congregation so she could preach to them. That we know. She was not sent as a preacher. She was sent as a servant of the church, a woman known for her gifts of service in what area. We do not know. The commentators go round and round the barn on the issue. But I think at the end of the day, we've got to be content with God's shut mouth as well as God's open mouth. And all we know is she's a servant of the church at Sancria. And he's saying, receive her in the Lord worthily and assist her in whatever matter she may have need of you. She has been a helper of many and of mine own self. So here's a proven sister who is urged to exercise her gifts now in conjunction with the ministry and the labors of the saints of God at Rome. Number six, how can we cultivate real, bona fide, down-to-earth interchurch communion by the recognition of the validity of oversight and discipline of other churches. By the recognition of the validity of the oversight and discipline of other churches. The very New Testament concept of letters of commendation seems to be rooted in this concern among the early churches. We don't want self-pronounced believers showing up on the doorstep of other churches and mooching off the people of God while they are hypocrites, or fleecing the people of God of their money, or twisting their thinking with false doctrine. Carry your letter of commendation from a church already known by the receiving church. What's a letter mean from church A if church B, to whom it is sent, doesn't know church A exists? The assumption is there's some awareness of each other's existence. And the letter of commendation has some significance in that context. And now I'm going to read word for word what I've written here in my notes. In our day, it is nothing short of scandalous that there is so little recognition and practical implementation of this principle among evangelical and even Reformed churches. When you are interviewing anyone for membership in your own assembly, Carefully check their ecclesiastical pathway. How did they come to you? If they say they were members of some other church, do your homework. If they do not bring a letter of commendation or their overseers do not go before with sending a letter of commendation, even though you may have requested it, then be sure to do your homework. Find out what 
kind of trail they've left behind them. But in many places, it's simply known you go sour on the ministry of Church A and for some piddling reason desire to jump ship, you are welcomed with open arms in Church B, no questions asked. No communication from the leaders of Church B to Church A. We understand so-and-so was a member. Have they left in good standing? Are there any pastoral concerns we should be aware of as we are contemplating receiving them into membership? Just, you'd say, even common courtesy would tell you to do that. And certainly any kind of biblical ecclesiology will demand that of us. And so, brethren, I urge you, while you may not be able to rubber stamp the actions of the previous church, at least it will be plain to the leaders of that church you've made an honest effort to fulfill the biblical injunction, John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And also such actions would fulfill the golden rule. The older I get, the more I want to open up a factory that produces plaques with the golden rule printed and over it saying, it is golden, use it. As you would that others do unto you, even so do ye also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. While the command to love God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself, we can distill those two into one. As you would that others do unto you, even so do you unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now it may mean everything bound up in the second command, loving your neighbor, is distilled. Most likely that's where it's pointing. I, I overkilled when I said it's the distillation of both. But it certainly is of the second, because Jesus said so. This is the law and the prophets. Summarize all the ethical norms that have trans-dispensational trans impact. And they're all summarized in that simple injunction, as you would that others do unto you, even so do ye also unto them. Seventh word of practical counsel, by seeking and offering counsel between pastors and the churches when it is requested. You don't go around saying, uh, brother, I want to express inner church communion. I'd like to counsel you. No. <laughs> you, brother, I'd like to get to know you. Can we meet for coffee? And we get to know one another. And then the time may come when you will earn the right to bring a word of exhortation to your brother and then make, uh, make a framework where he has confidence in you to seek your counsel in matters relative to his life and his labors. Certainly the principle at the church level is clearly seen in my judgment in the Acts 15 passage. Here's a local church at Antioch that's got big bad problems. They said, let's go back to the chief boys up in Jerusalem and get this problem sorted out. Get their counsel, get their input, get their pronouncement. And then at the personal level, I hope you'll love the book of Philemon. It is a beautiful distillation of so many principles of how you cultivate interchurch communion through brethren sensitive to one another. When the apostle says, now look, in a sense, you owe your very life to me, and I could pull rank, but, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to appeal to you in love. And by the way, brother, without your mind, humble leader there in a, probably a house church, and an apostle says, without your mind, I will do nothing. Takes the bended knee, endears himself. The whole epistle is full of principles so applicable to the cultivating of warm, open face, transparent, loving interchurch communion mediated by interchurch communion through the leadership of those churches. Number eight, if we want interchurch communion, we'll get it by the periodic public recognition of the persons and ministries of other proven servants of Christ. 
I didn't have the word proven in your notes, add it if you want, by the periodic public recognition of the persons and ministries of other proven servants of Christ. Who can measure the blessing that has come to the churches of a number of you men sitting right here by a practice that by the grace of God we were determined to implement very early in our life here and it may have been spontaneous generation in other places at the same time, I don't know, but I know what it has done when we have heard of a proven servant of God who loves and believes the things we do and we've invited him to come and either take our men's or women's conference or a Lord's Day of ministry and use the adult class where all the adults are gathered, sometimes call in the teenagers, and have a man give his testimony and give the history of the church where he labors. That has been probably, uh, be careful what I'm saying, but I believe if not the most critical principle that has produced interchurch communion that I've witnessed in my nearly 50 years of ministry. Because it brings a whole church into another church by means of its leader so that when we talk about such and such a church, oh, that's the place where brother so-and-so told us, this is what God did. This little group of people began to pray, and this is how God led them eventually to put themselves under the oversight of another church while they were in formation. And this is what happened when they were constituted, and when God gave them their first officers, etc. And then as the prayer letters are shared, the knowledge of that place that began with that initial exchange of pulpit ministry continues to bear fruit and more fruit and more fruit. We have seen that happen with regard to our missionary endeavors. It was having that kind of relationship in the emergence of the church in Flemington that brought Pastor Dunn and Trinity close. That then brought him into the Pakistan ministry where he's paid 15 visits, I believe, to Pakistan and had a formative influence on a whole generation of preachers that he's ministered to year after year and expanded the vision of his church. Pakistan has been as much a part of their vision as it has been of ours. And the thing multiplies. Standing here talking about it, Dippy head and all, I get the goosebumps. Brethren, once you get hooked on this perspective, you can't do anything other than be aggressive in seeking to promote that kind of communion and fellowship by means of the periodic recognition of other brethren in their ministry. And then ninthly, by the public intercession for other churches and servants of Christ. By the public intercession. I mean by that, that in your public worship there is structured into it in either your weekly pastoral prayer in the morning or the evening, however you do it, it's not something that you fly by the seat of your pants. You have the churches with whom you're holding closer communion. You identify them and you work into your liturgy some regular, consistent public intercession for those churches and for those servants of Christ. The paradigm passage for that is obviously the one I've already quoted from Ephesians 6, verses 18 and 19, where Paul says, Your prayer and your watchfulness and perseverance in supplication is to be for all the saints, that's the brothers and sisters, and on my behalf, the servants of God, that utterance may be given Unto me. And then you have that beautiful passage in Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Paul writes concerning Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always striving for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has much labor for you and for them in Laodicea and for them in Hierapolis. Those three churches were close together and apparently the knowledge of this servant of God, of Epaphras, 
concerning those other churches was not minimal, but it was maximal, so much so that he couldn't pray for his home church back at Colossae without praying for two sister churches with whom there was this close and intimate relationship. At this point, let me quote Owen. The good old doctor, my patron saint, John Owen, he writes, This communion of churches in faith consists much in the principal fruit of it, namely, prayer. So it is stated in Ephesians 2.18, For through Christ we have access in one spirit unto the Father, and therein the communion of the Catholic Church doth consist. The apostle declares in the following verses, Now therefore, for prayers in all churches having one object, which is God, even the Father, God as the Father, proceeding in all from one and the same Spirit, given unto them as the Spirit of grace and supplication to make intercession for them, and all of them continually offered unto God by the same high priest, who adds unto it the incense of his own intercession, and by whom they have all an access unto the throne of grace, they have all a blessed communion herein continually. And this communion is the more expressed in that the prayers are for all, so as that there is no particular church of Christ in the world, not any one member of any one of them, but they have the prayers of all the churches in all the world and all the members of them every day. And however this communion be invisible unto the eye of flesh, it is glorious and conspicuous unto the eye of faith and is a part of the glory of Christ the mediator in heaven. Then he goes on to say, But now if there be any other persons or churches which have any other object of their prayers but God the Father, and as our Father in Christ or any other mediators or intercessors by whom to convey or present their prayers to God, but Christ alone, the only high priest of the church, or do renounce the aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit as a spirit of grace and supplication, they cut themselves off from all communion with the Holy Catholic Church. Summarize that one sentence, the Roman Catholic Church ain't part of the Catholic Church. <laughs> They approach God in some other way than the mediation of Christ, some other way than by the energizing power of the Spirit. They are no true church. Owen's constantly going after them in rather long uh, Ciceronian Latinized English, as Dr. Packer called it. I wouldn't know Ciceronian Latinized English from spaghetti if you showed it to me. I'm quoting uh, Packer concerning Owen's lengthy sentences. But in all seriousness, brethren, something of that needs to grip us, that even when we are not praying for specific churches, we know in our prayers, Lord, be with your saints all across the world this day. As Dave and I were praying this morning, part of his prayer was that God would bless all the preaching that went on all over the world yesterday on the Lord's Day, in every place, that Christ would gather out his elect and build up his people. And I was challenged just by that prayer to remember we are to pray for all the saints. We can't pray for them all by name, but by their identity as saints. We can pray for them, and that helps our people when they hear us lead in prayer, that we're conscious we're one little itsy-bitsy part of some great and grand and glorious thing called the Holy Catholic Church existing throughout the world. Having considered these nine ways, practical ways, to cultivate interchurch communion, then we have to ask the question, to what extent can we nurture and express our oneness with the body of Christ in concrete acts of interchurch communion? And my answer to that question has three strands. Number one, first of all, we can and should do these things to the extent that there is no erosion, compromise, or contradiction of our clearly defined mission and present condition as a local church. We should do this without 
in any way eroding, compromising, or contradicting our clearly defined mission and present condition as a local church. God does not call us all to do in the larger field of interchurch communion anything that would undermine our local stewardship both of doctrine and of practice. For example, it might be a matter of gracious expediency in a well-established and mature church to receive people into your midst if you are a Baptist church of pedo-Baptist views into the membership. That might be. I'm not saying it is. It could be a wise, gracious expedient with certain conditions set in that act. However, if it's a newly established work, people just becoming grounded in their understanding of the scriptures and those distinctive doctrines that mark you out, not separate you from, but mark you out as a distinct local body, it might be unwise to make such a suggestion. It could cause confusion and end up causing division. God doesn't want you to do a good thing in order to create a bad thing. And if we had to weigh, what's the worst thing to do? Disappointing a couple applying for membership because of this anomaly or to run the risk of fissuring the body of Christ that is already united. Well, it's obvious, I think. And we may have to wrestle with things like that, but if we can get hold of the principle, it will help us to wend our way through some of these more difficult things. Secondly, we can and should cultivate interchurch fellowship in proportion to our unity and faith with those churches. Those churches sharing the same confession of faith should engage in making more effort along these nine lines that I've laid out to cultivate interchurch communion. Such churches should seek to share in various ministries, missionary concerns, etc. And thankfully, a good bit of that does go on among our churches. And I'm grateful to witness that and to see it grow and develop. And we ought to aspire to do more and more. Paul said to the Thessalonians concerning brotherly love, I don't have to write you, but I'm exhorting you to do it more and more. He said, I'm not correcting you, I'm not reproving you, I'm not pointing out deficiency. I'm just saying, aspire to greater efficiency in loving one another. And that's my word of exhortation on this matter. We can and should cultivate interchurch fellowship in proportion to our unity of faith and life with those churches. And then thirdly, in seeking to express in tangible ways our commitment to inter-church communion and fellowship, we should consider the providentially arranged relationships in the body of Christ. If God providentially, like we've got several churches from represented here with pastors from Virginia, God's providentially clustered them, it would be unthinkable if they didn't develop more intimate ties of fellowship than they have with us up here in New Jersey. When God providentially plants churches at Laodicea, Hierapolis, and what was the third one? I don't feel so bad. You can't remember either. Okay, but God providentially, it'd be unthinkable that they did not cultivate deeper fellowship. On the other hand, when missionary endeavors of a given church bring that church into intimate relationship with God's people thousands of miles away, those churches are nonetheless under obligation to recognize God's providence in giving them that stewardship of missionary endeavor. And in that situation, there has to be a conscience about the relationship. This is one of the things that greatly disturbed me in my years in broad evangelicalism, where the churches took on people who were being sent out by mission boards who came through doing their holy begging. That's called raising your support. And then they went on the list of your missionaries, and you have a church with 50 missionaries. They barely know them from the neighbor next door. There's no meaningful engagement. Now, the meaningful engagement is costly. It means that the pastors here periodically 
traverse half the world into an alien culture, into a wearying schedule in order to make it evident that our relationship to a little struggling church in Rawapindi buried in the Sea of Islam, that that relationship is real and vital. And even though it's costly, it's costly to bring the pastor over here. You don't buy round-trip air tickets to Pakistan for $4.95. 4.95 or 4.95.00. But that's part of the stewardship God's given to this particular assembly, and He will, in His blessing, begin to give more and more of those stewardships if our churches are healthy and growing and our vision for the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth is vibrant, then there will be more and more opportunities to manifest that kind of genuine Catholicity with the church universal. Let me just quickly now quote from John Owen again, very helpful insights. Having then we acknowledge lieth the great difference which we have with others about the state of Christ in this world. We do believe that the mutual communion of particular churches among themselves in an equality of power and order, though not of gifts and usefulness, is the only way appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ after the death of the apostles for the attaining the general end of all particular churches, which is the edification of the church Catholic in faith, love, and peace. And then he goes on to say, any purported way that's supposed to be of God, that transcends the nature of each church standing under the sovereignty of Christ, diversity of gifts, diversity of opportunities, but no group lording it over another. Any other structure goes against the revealed will of Christ. And here again, he's going against papacy and going against prelacy, the structure in the Anglican church as well. So these suggestions I lay before you. And now in conclusion, having underscored the scriptural basis for interchurch communion, having addressed the question concerning the extent to which we should engage in these practices, just a couple of concluding exhortations. Number one, be very careful always to treat and refer to brethren as brethren. Be careful always to treat and refer to brethren as brethren. The Bible recognizes the difference between error, limited understanding, and holding confessionally heretical doctrine or holding practically heretical doctrine. For example, while some of us firmly believe that the sprinkling of infants is not what the Bible means by baptism, the way we treat our pedobaptist brethren is entirely different from the way we would relate to a devout Roman Catholic who both understood and firmly believed Roman Catholic doctrine. We're out to convert to Catholic. We would love it if we could change the opinion of our pedobaptist brother. But he's our brother. The intelligent, confessional Roman Catholic is not our brother, not our sister. No one can understandably embrace Romish teaching and practice and be a Christian. I'll state that bluntly, and I don't believe it can be refuted from the Scriptures. Oh, but I know, I know this one, I know. Let's take the Scripture as our guide. Secondly, avoid a sectarian attitude while at the same time holding tenaciously to your distinctive convictions of conscience. Romans 14, 12, let every man uh, to his own master a servant stands or falls. And the related text, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Avoid terminology when referring to other real Christians that will unnecessarily offend or inflame. Remember the injunction, let not your good be evil spoken of. Don't unnecessarily use the labels Reformed, Calvinistic, Reformed Baptist. I don't know how many of your prayer letters, perhaps some of you here, 
got edited before I read them in prayer meeting. If your prayer letter said, we ask your prayers as we are seeking to establish a Reformed Baptist church in such and such a town. You know how I read those letters? We solicit your prayers as we seek to establish a vibrant biblical church in such and such a town. That's what we want to see. Don't use terms that will become semi-cultic in the minds of your people that highlight your difference from others. And once I say, I am a Reformed Baptist, I'm highlighting wherein I differ from my pedo-baptist friends and from my non-Reformed friends. Now, in talking theologically, it's good code language. It helps us, saves verbiage, it saves clicking the keys. But in public, Seek to cultivate in your people a genuinely Catholic spirit. And that kind of spirit wants to see a God-honoring, Bible-based, Bible-shaped church come to birth in such and such a place. I suggest that you use terminology as much as possible that avoids those kind of words that can trigger a response that is not what you want to trigger. If someone comes up to me and says, Mr. Martin, I've heard you're a Calvinist, are you? I say, I don't know. What do you mean by the term? I let him define what in his mind Calvinist means. And once he does, I may say, no, I ain't one of those. I'd never be one of those as long as I believe my Bible. Or I may say, if that's what you mean, I do believe that what has been called Calvinism is the most accurate identification of how and why God saves sinners. And then I define for him what I mean by a Calvinist and get a chance to say what the gospel is. Because for me, that's what the gospel is. God comes in sovereign grace to quicken dead sinners. And if he starts it, he's going to complete it. There's your old five points. He takes people going one way, grabs them by the neck and turns them another way. That's effectual calling. You ask me, I believe that? Yeah, I believe that. My neck's been grabbed and I've been turned. I believe that. And I don't believe God put me in the way to have me fall along the way. He's going to take me safely home. If that's what you mean by perseverance and preservation, thank God I'm in the orbit of it. So I got carried away, brethren. But do you see the point I'm making? Avoid the slightest tendency then to erode the biblical doctrine of the parity of churches under the Lordship of Christ. That's my final word of counsel. And you've got quote number 42 of Owen, where he underscores that principle again. There was something in Owen that really generated a passion about this matter of no church trying to dumb down or step down over another church. We recognize each true church is an expression of Christ's architectural and construction work. I will build my church. Let's respect his work wherever we see it and seek to enter into meaningful communion with them. Well, thank you, brethren, for being good listeners and hanging in there with me for an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm grateful now that I got two of the addendum messages done Two more tomorrow, God willing, and then the first session in the afternoon, we move into pastoral counseling. Let's pray and thank the Lord for his help in our time together. Father, we are indeed deeply grateful for your goodness in drawing near to us, giving the men attentive eyes and, we believe, ears, and we trust hearts as well for helping your servant in the sense of his own felt weakness, enabling me to utter the truth of your word with a sense of the help of the Holy Spirit. We are humbled whenever you draw near and take the likes of us and are pleased to hear and answer our prayers. Receive our gratitude. Bless the men as they make their way to their homes Give us all a good night of rest. May we awake refreshed and invigorated, ready to come to our sessions in dependence upon your spirit and with the consciousness of your nearness. Hear our prayers and receive our praises as we do offer them only as they are made fragrant with the incense of the intercession of our great high priest, even the Lord Jesus. 
Amen.